So joining us now is Wickham Wanderers' Jack Grimmer, who is obviously no stranger to a playoff final. Jack, thanks very much for joining us. First of all, a playoff final, competing for a place in the Skybet Championship next season. Can you quite believe it? And to, you know, officially be the playoff final and, and, and it's happening on Monday is, you know, you still need to pinch yourself and... Um, I think all throughout the season, the belief's been there that I think from the players, um, the belief's been there that we could do something special and, you know, hopefully, yeah, really hopefully we can, we can finish that journey that we started so, like over a year ago now, because it's July, you know, it's, it's over a year since pre-season and, um, and yeah, it's, it's a, an amazing achievement, but one that, you know, we're, we're not finished yet. We've got something to do on Monday, hopefully. And I just want to go back to the semi-finals uh, against Fleetwood. Both legs were as good as you could get for a playoff game, weren't they? I mean, they just had everything, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I remember them um, because, you know, I think the fans aren't there. It, you are more aware that it's on TV. I think that sort of, you seen the cameras stick out more. And I, I remember thinking like six minutes in and it's 2-1, like, wow, like, you know, my family and friends are going to be loving this game. But, um, yeah, I think that the game's had everything, you know, sending off penalties, um, JJ doing his usual scoring from corners, that's become the usual, that's the normal for him, you know. Um, you know, even even him doing that, and I think it's it just shows you what the playoffs are like, and I think, over two games, it's kind of a toss-up, but over one game especially, you know, anything can happen. And I think that's something that we're looking forward to on Monday is just the uncertainty that we've got to embrace. And, um, and yeah, it's just, just know that anything can happen on the day. And how tough was it being back out there after, as you mentioned, there was such a long break away from football. How tough was it for you, both mentally and phys physically? Because there was a lot riding on the two games, wasn't there? Yeah, exactly. I think it was weird because we sort of started the we started playing games um, in training, and it it it's sort of that preseason feel. You know, people are passing sideways and backwards, and then but you're going in to play the biggest game of the season. You're not going in to start, a, you know, forty game plus season. You're and um and that was the most interesting thing was I thought that the, the first game especially. Um, the second game was a bit different because obviously we had the lead and we just wanted to defend for 90 minutes pretty much. But um, the first game especially was quite high tempo. Do you see that by the, you know, three goals in the first 10 minutes or whatever it was? Um, and I think, you know, both teams sort of knew what was on the line. Um, and, you know, especially I think more so because the finals at Wembley, you're going to be at Wembley, you're, you're going to be under no illusion that just what is at stake. Um but no, it was weird, yeah, it was weird after such a long period away and the world has completely changed since the last time we played a game of football. Um, it, was, it was a weird one, but it was, it was a welcomed return. I think not just, for, not just for players and staff, but for fans as well. And just looking at the playoff final itself, you've obviously played in a playoff final before and won with Coventry a few years ago. Obviously, Coventry won the game. Ultimately, you won promotion from League Two to League One. I just want to go back to that day and, and winning at Wembley in front of all those fans and scoring a, a goal, a very good goal as well. What an experience yeah, for you. Like, you. What do you remember about that day? Um, to be honest, not very much. If, if, I'm, being, if I'm being honest, like, I can't. So I, I, I remember obviously my goal um, and then I remember the feeling at full time. I have no idea like what happened in the first half. I have no idea sort of. I've no idea how the game went, if I'm honest. I can't really, it's just, it's, it's a whirlwind like I've never experienced. I remember sitting before the match and pre-match and, you know, you're trying to eat food to get energy and you're just not hungry. And, you know, every mouthful, you just think you're forcing it down. And, and it's, an, it's a feeling I've never experienced. And for it to end the way it did, you know, with scoring the, the goal was just... It's um, it's something that I've watched back thousands of times. Um, you know, I would love to replicate it on Monday <laughs> if I can get anything like that. I think I think being experiencing that, you know, with forty plus thousand Coventry fans, it'll be even more weird. You know, with no one in the stadium, um, it'll be a really really weird one. It'll be a completely the opposite. You know, an empty stadium compared to a full one. But it's 
there's even more on the line now. You know, there's the championship beckons for whoever wins. And, you know, it was for, for Coventry, it was not a necessity to get promoted, but they were very much reliant on getting promoted yeah. and it was expected of us. Whereas no one is expecting us to do this at Wickham. And I think that's been sort of our sort of silver lining all season is that no one's really put any pressure on us. No one's backed us on Monday. We're, we're heavy underdogs. You know, Oxford are a great, a great footballing team. Um, and there's no pressure on us. There's, there hasn't been all season. Even when we held a three goal lead against Fleetwood, you know, the manager was saying, there's no pressure on you. Like just go out and enjoy the game, enjoy the experience. And um and yeah, I think that, that bodes well for us that we're always sort of, everyone keeps writing us off and we keep coming back. And Wickham seems to thrive off that as well. Am I right in saying that as a team, you just thrive off saying, look, there's no pressure on us, just, just go and play. And if you win, you win. Yeah, I think, you know, I think around about Christmas time, we sort of dipped. And I think it was because, you know, we found ourselves top at Christmas having not really looked at the table um, and I think it is something that we thrive off is that, you know, it's a team full of people that every team is, is a team full of players that have been written off by someone. Um, you know, uh, there's not a football player out there that hasn't been told he's a bad player by someone, either a fan or a manager, you know. But I think with us, it's, you know, a team that's came together and, and really sort of face, do, does well in adversity. I think even the other night against Fleetwood, when we conceded the first goal, you know, some teams might have sort of imploded and then conceded a second, and, but we managed to get the goal back that made it a bit easier for us. And I think we've got a, a changing room full of strong characters, um, which it's it's a cliche, you know, but, you know, I've not experienced a changing room like it. And I think it's been a, it's been an absolute journey from pre-season. Um, you know, the, we've got some experienced heads in the changing room that have been essential to what we've created. Um, the manager is sort of well, very well known for being sort of unorthodox. And I think that's something that I've loved, you know, being a part of. And I think it's, we've created a lot of noise, you know, throughout the league has been, you know, little Wickham up there. How, how are they up there? And I think that's, that's definitely something we've thrived on. Um, and, you know, to complete, sort of to come full circle and complete that on Monday would, would just be an unbelievable achievement. I'm going to come on to the, the type of football club that Wickham is in a moment. But just before I do, it might be a difficult one for you to answer, but you were released from Coventry in the summer of, of 2019 after only making 13 appearances in League One last season. Was that a difficult time for you? Was there, was there a time when you weren't sure, you know, where you'd be playing your football or what league you'd be playing in this season? Oh, yeah. Um, and I think it was, you know, it was quite... Uh, it's a, it, it was a massive uh, a learning curve for me because sort of this season, the year before I scored at Wembley, I won at Wembley, I was on top of the world. Um, and then, you know, the manager changes his opinion, changes his tactics, you know, players fall out of favour and, um, you know, to keep motivated throughout the year and not getting the chance. And then in the summer, like you say, you're, you're really uncertain about where you're going to be. Um, then the dreaded, the time comes, you know, that teams are back in pre-season and you're not at a team. And um, and I think that's, I remember sort of, I'd been linked with teams, I'd spoken with teams and just nothing had felt the right fit. I knew that I had to get to a team that, one, I was going to play, I wanted to feel wanted, I wanted to feel sort of part of it again. Because, you know, in the first season at Coventry, I had that and it's a feeling that I thrive off is, you know, everyone wants to be wanted. Like, it's just yeah. natural for anyone. And, and I wanted to sort of, of have that feeling and so I hadn't I'd had offers but I didn't have anything that sort of ticked enough boxes and I'm not saying that I had many offers that you know I could pick and choose but just for me it was about enjoying my football again and feeling happy um and as soon as as soon as Gareth Ainsworth called I just I had that feeling it, it, he's someone that I'd came across and played against and he'd always kind of he and I kind of experienced with Mickey Mellon um previously at Shrewsbury and he'd always kind of been a manager. I thought, like, I'd like to play for you. Like, you look like, you know, a good guy. You look like someone I'd connect with well. And, and, um, and yeah, and it was when I, as soon as I got the call, it was, it was after a long summer of complete uncertainty, which I think, you know, footballers are quick to do interviews when 
you know, you're scoring at Wembley or you're playing at Wembley, but, you know, other people don't see the side of things when you're, you're not contracted to a club and, you know, you're really thinking your, your sleepless nights worrying like what is going to happen. And, um, and it was a big learning curve for me. It, it happened before I joined Coventry, you know, I was talking with clubs and again, I needed that right fit. Um, so it was quite, yeah, it, it was, it was a learning curve. It was a horrible experience, but it was a learning curve. And, you know, I, I thank, I'm, I'm very, very, it makes me even more thankful being in this position now that, you know, I chose to hold off and wait for what I felt was the right fit um, for my happiness and enjoying football more than anything. And, um, and thankfully, yeah, it's paid off. And, and, and I think that's sort of, sort of when I got the phone call, it just made me more hungry to come in and be like, show why, to repay the faith that, you know, Gareth has shown in me and by signing me. And, um, and I think that's, that was not just me, but a number of players in the team this season have that hunger to, to show um, that they can do well at this level and, and you know, push on a level. And I think that's why he's gotten the best out of us. And I, and I hope I've gone some way to sort of repaying that faith that he showed him in the summer. And so I just want to touch on what you said earlier about Wickham. Uh, you know, and, and the dressing room and being slightly, you know, unorthodox. You've obviously experienced a number of different dressing rooms throughout your career playing football. When you look at the type of people that Wickham has at the club, you know, your Akin Fenwars, your Gareth Ainsworth, it's certainly a unique football club in that sense, isn't it, with the type of people that it's got there? It is, it is. I think, you know, you only need to see about halfway through the season when the gaffer released I Am A Wanderer, the rock song, and... Um, <laughs> You know, to, to see, like, you know, and a few of my mates have, have commented, you know, you see him on against Fleetwood in his leather jacket and, you know, just on the side, he's just so different. And um, it's not just him, you know, a massive part is Richard Dobson, the assistant, and Josh Hart, the analyst, Dave Waits, you know, his whole his whole sort of staff behind him, the core network, um, really all have the same sort of morals and the way they do things. And they're all on the same page, which I think is big in football. If you can get everyone on the same page, it makes everything a lot easier. But I think he's got that sort of core of, um, like you say, Akin Fema, Matt Bloomfield, Joe Jacobson, Dom Gape, Darius Charles, you know, a lot of experience that these players have had through, you know, good experiences, bad experiences. Um, and I think they their hunger if anyone is lacking a bit of hunger this season they are there to say like we are doing this like we are doing this we're getting promoted and I think that's been huge for us huge for the gaffer probably because he knows that he doesn't need to you know it's one of those change rooms that you, the gaffer can probably sit back and relax because the change room very much takes care of itself um with the personalities in it you know you have like sort of hierarchy of about of, of certain players as you tend to get that you know take care of everyone else and um, and I think, yeah, you, you only need to speak to the players there that tell you it's they've not seen a change room like it. Uh, and it does make me feel old, but I've, I've been in sort of 10, 10 years, nine, 10 years changing rooms worth. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's not nothing like I've experienced, that's for sure. And as someone who was new to it this year, I'm interested what it was like when you came in, because I spoke to Joe Jacobson uh, before the semi-finals. And he was saying how at the start of pre-season, you know, they only had nine players contracted to the club. And, and the aim was to reach a point of safety in League One and just guarantee safety and then just, you know, see what happens from there. As someone who was new to the club this year and has only just come in, is, is it what you expected this season? Or are you surprised by where you've ended up in the league table? Yeah, I think it, it's quite, it is quite an interesting point because, you know, like you said, JJ started with, they started with nine players in pre-season and even around Christmas time, you know, people were joking saying, get to 50 points, like get to 50 points. Yeah. And, and it was kind of, it was, it was like a breath of fresh air, I think, some new players coming in and like I, I you know, hadn't been there the season before where they had sort of struggled for safety. And, um, and when I joined, they had brought in sort of the caliber of players that they were going for. You know, there were there were known players, there were known names in the game, and I think everyone kind of thought, "Oh well, like wait a minute, we're getting we're getting him, we're getting him." You know, well, you know, we could we could maybe you know do something, but it was 
very much muted site like muted chat you know no one was saying oh we're we're gonna get the playoffs here like you know I think everyone one of the big things about the change room is they're very humble and I think you know even after I've never seen anything like it I remember when we got to Wembley with Coventry we beat Notts County away and the celebrations were unreal you know we were buzzing we got to Wembley on Monday night the music wasn't even on in the changing room. People were like in ice baths. We were like on the bikes doing recovery. And, you know, everyone was like, okay, we've, we've done well, you know, we've won. But there was such a, everyone was just so humble about in, in victory. Um, and, you know, we weren't going over the top because at the end of the day, we have achieved nothing yet. Um, but no, it, it was just, it's, it's a, I, I don't think you can, I never, to say I expected to, do as well as we did I'd be lying if I said yeah I think I wanted a, a good positive season playing games enjoying my football again um, and I thought whatever happens happens but when you find yourself sort of top at Christmas you think <sighs> like I remember my fiance kept saying oh you are doing well you are doing well and I kept saying oh it's just the start it's just the start like we've had a good start and then she was like it's Christmas like you're nearly halfway through like it's not just the start anymore. And you do turn a corner, you think, like, we don't want to throw this away now. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's been nice. Like, like I said at the start, having no pressure um, has been a big thing. And, and being the sort of small Wickham in amongst all the big names has been something that the gaffer has very much played on. And I think that's very much worked to our advantage, yeah. There's clearly a real togetherness at the club, as you mentioned. But we saw after the semi-finals... Um, Bayo almost giving the team talk on the pitch whilst the manager was doing the post-match interviews. Is that something that that's done often? Is that a role that he takes on uh, as well as the manager? Yeah, I think it's it's very interesting because obviously uh, Bayo isn't so Bayo isn't our captain, but I think it's it shows just what everyone thinks about him that he can, can he can demand that sort of respect. Um, our actual captain Blooms, Matt Bloomfield, he does it a lot as well. Obviously, as you can imagine, he's the he's the captain. Um, you know, Darius Charles is another one that speaks heavily to the group. And I think you have these players that the gaffer almost doesn't need to motivate. He does. I mean, I, I walked out. I remember after the meeting we had before the Fleetwood game on Friday, I would have walked through a brick wall. Like I, we were all just ready for the game after the gaffer speech. But you know, when you've got these players in your changing room that can sort of deliver that motivational speech and really I think it was interesting both Bale's chats after the games were about grounding us again and really like you know taking us back down we'd, we'd got to we'd officially got into the playoff final and it was about you know respect and coming back down and getting ready for the final on Monday which which was you know again it was sort of nice to keep level headed and I think when you've got those players in the change room that can deliver those sort of speeches it must take a, a lot of heat off the gaffer um, and it must be a comfort for him knowing that like I said before it it, it um, sort of the change room takes care of itself in that respect. And just picking up on something you just said there as well because interestingly Joe Jacobson, Joe Jacobson said exactly the same thing that you said last week he said there's something about Gareth Ainsworth that makes him and the rest of the players want to run through brick walls for him. So what is it about Gareth Ainsworth that brings that out in you as players? Right. I, I mean, I think one of, one of the things, so after, especially for me after last season was, you know, our, our footballers in general are very quick to sort of be the fall guy in things or, you know, they're footballers, so he's fine. Like, like even through coronavirus, I've, I've seen the Premier League footballers were getting the blame for some things and, and you know, saying that they needed to step up. And I think in a world that sort of is very stereotypical when it comes to footballers, Gareth Ainsworth is, he sees us all as people. He sees us all as individuals that have families, that have dogs, that have kids, that are moving houses that are you know planning holidays and and I think for me personally after you know last season sort of obviously not playing as much your relationship with the manager is is going to go downhill because you know he you feel he doesn't trust you etc and and then for me this I came into the perfect place in the perfect club um you know even through coronavirus the, the gaffer was phoning us, making sure our families were okay, making sure we were okay. 
um, possibly because he knew we were coming back to play the playoffs, but <laughs> and he needed us all in a good place. But, um, but no, it was it was honestly it, he sees us as individuals, and and I think that's his main strength is his man management. You know, he's very he's down to earth. He's he's very individual himself. You know, he's uh, with his his rock and roll sort of style and his management style. I think after that speech, that speech was very much about you know, our families and who, who do we do this for? Who do we play for? Who do you, you care for? And it, and it really, it did touch me a lot. Um, and, you know, so I wasn't sure if I was ready to walk through brick walls or cry. Like, <laughs> but no, I, think that's, I think that's one of his, I think generally that's one of his biggest sort of things is that every, and I think it rubs off in the change room because you have players that are not afraid to be themselves and they don't fit to a stereotype. They don't, you know, JJ, I've heard in an interview before, has mentioned that the conversations are, are, are so varied from politics to music to, you know, anything. And it's not your sort of stereotypical football chat um, that gets discussed. And I think, you know, people have very... And, and the debates as well can get quite heated because, you know, it, when you have such individual people, people that are not scared to be themselves, you know, opinions can get raised. And I think... It's it all just adds together. It comes together in one big pot to really have a great result. I think in the end, yeah. And so just looking ahead to the final itself, then on Monday, obviously when you played for Coventry in the playoff final, you were playing in front of a near sold out Wembley Stadium. Obviously on Monday you'll be playing in front of sadly an empty stadium. But does that change your approach at all, or do you think it makes it easier, or does it make it harder? Um, I know, I don't know. I think today was sort of the first day, weirdly, I think I've been that tired after the other night, but I think today was sort of the first day that I really, like, because I drive past Wembley going to training every day, so it's it's literally always been on my mind every day, driving past, I see the arch, and I think, I remember thinking all through the day, like, we, I'm going to see you in May, like, I am going to see you in May. Obviously, it's July because of <laughs> coronavirus, but July or May, I'll take both of them, but... I think playing without fans, I think, will be a very, very weird, um, a very weird sort of situation because, you know, you'll hopefully be who, whatever team will be celebrating sort of one of the pinnacles of their career, and to have that, I think it just really hits home how important fans are. Um, you know, the other night when we score to make it two each in the relief, it was an amazing feeling. But with fans in the stadium, it would have been unbelievable. And my goal at Wembley would have been 1% of what it was if I didn't have 40,000 40, fans jumping up in front of me in sky blue. And I think it's this sort of pandemic has really shown just how, like, football is. It's, it's a cliche saying, but football is nothing without fans. Like, it just isn't. Yeah. Um, you know, it's obviously I still love football, but it's not half the thing. It's not, you don't get the same adrenaline buzz and, and stuff when you're not playing in front of fans. But... I don't know if it really helps us or hinders us. In the same for Oxford, I don't. I don't know if, what they're thinking, but um, you know, I think we would. Either way, I think you'll feel the support of your family and your friends, and you just have to look at the big TV cameras in the corners to to remember. And the fact that you're at Wembley well, speaks volumes. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think it. It really. I think it's just something we've came to terms with, and you have to get on with. And it's it'll forever be that, like, oh, yeah, I got to the playoff final, but it was in front of 10 people because of the pandemic. You know, I think it's just one of those things that we'll have to deal with, yeah. And just on your family, um, have they got any plans for Monday night? Are they gathering together to watch it? How are they going to follow the game? Yeah, I think um, a few... Well, it's it's quite... it's Scot Scotland's a little bit further behind in terms of, like, what they're allowed to do um, compared to England. Like, the... I think the pubs in that aren't open yet because the Scots probably can't be trusted quite yet. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, they are, they are planning on gathering some of them together and, and watching the game. I think just to help my nerves, um, sorry, the nerves of my mum and sister and fiancé, I think they'll all probably help each other as best they can um, because they do tend to get very nervous, which thankfully doesn't rub off on me. Um, but yeah, I think that... That's all you can do. I think, you know, I sent them all scarves and flags and things like that for the semi-finals, which was a nice touch. I think that's just what you've got to do in this time is do little things that you might not normally do. And um, so, yeah, I think they'll hopefully get together and, uh, 
and be supporting us through the TV, which I'll, I'll probably hear them from Scotland anyway, so it'll be fine. <laughs> and, and so what about Oxford United then? Again, slight underdog status this season, but you know they beat a very good Portsmouth side to get to the final on Monday night. What can you expect from them on the day, do you think? Um, a very good football passing team, I think. Um, you know, similar to Fleetwood, I think that, that Monday night game was, for us, the hardest game we've played this season. Fleetwood turned up with nothing to lose and passed us off the pitch. And I think, you know, knowing Carl Robinson, I think he, he very much plays the same way. He did it amazingly with MK Dons, managed to come through the leagues. And um, I think with Oxford, it's pretty much the same. Um, you know, they, they love to keep the ball, um, which I think for us is, is the touch wood is, is, is a good thing. You know, I think it's, it, we're very confident that, you know, you can combat their strengths and, um, you know, hopefully we've got a plan that will that'll ne- like nullify their strengths and, and really sort of give us a chance of winning the game. But, you know, I, it's sort of like us, you know, I think they wouldn't be in the position unless they, believe, unless they deserve to be in the position. Um, and, you know, there was, it's quite a local derby, so I'm sure the fans will be delighted, you know, that we're playing Oxford with a chance to, you know, maybe jump above them. But, um, but yeah, I think I'm expecting a really tough game, um, you know, of they've got a lot of quality and a lot of experience actually throughout their side. So it should be, should be a really good game. And finally, I know you have touched on it, but you've experienced promotion before from League Two to League One. What would it mean now for, for you and the rest of the players to win promotion to the championship? It's one of the most watched divisions in the world. It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. And um, on a personal note, I'd, I'd, I would love to get another crack at it. Um, I played a little bit in it with Fulham. It probably, throughout my career, at a stage that I wasn't quite ready. Um, you know, I'd happily admit that I was probably a bit young and naive and I was thrust into a team that was expecting promotion and I found that hard to deal with mentally, you know, that, that kind of pressure at such a young age. And um, I've now sort of had that footballing journey, came back up through the leagues and to achieve promotion back to where I want to get to would be, would be unbelievable. But then to take into account to achieve it with this team would just be, would just be unbelievable. I think, um, you know, you would never wipe the smile off my face. Um, to come from where we've, like you say, when I first joined in pre-season, no one was even remotely talking about promotion. Um, and to achieve that, I think most importantly, to, to, to give it back to the gaffer and his assistant, Dobbo. I mean, the, the work they've put in when they first joined the club, um, for me, for, as well as the gaffer and that, to give it back to like Matt Bloomfield and JJ, you know, players that have been here for five years, 10 years, 15 years, to really help them push the club over that line would be for me the best thing um, and the best feeling so yeah here's hoping it's going to be a, a really good game on Monday and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it yeah